Welcome to a special edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Today, Andrew is teaching on who God is and who we are, recorded live from the 2019 Grace and Faith Conference in Telford, England. You need to recognize that you were an absolute mess before Jesus saved you. Apart from God's influence in your life, you just don't realize how perfect God created us to be. And now, here's Andrew. This week on our Gospel Truth broadcast, we are going to be doing something a little different. I'm going to be playing a live teaching that I did in Telford, England back at the end of May. And I was teaching about the true nature of God. I was doing it from a little bit different perspective, just talking about how that to have a relationship with God, you have to understand some basics about what His true nature and character is. And I tell you, most people have a misunderstanding about God and who He is. And so I think that this is really going to bless you. This was a teaching in Telford, England. We had about 3,000 people at the conference, and it was just an awesome time. So watch this as we air this uh, teaching that I did in Telford, England. You know, God laid some things on my heart for this week specifically. And I'm really excited about this. You probably heard me say this, but I have to tell you when I'm excited because I'm always like this. <laughs> I actually went to Disney World and you know, when you go on those roller coasters, they take pictures of everybody, you know, screaming and stuff. And then at the end of the ride, they sell it to you. You could have taken a picture of me right now. And that's the way I looked on that roller coaster. <laughs> that's good in some ways. I guess it's bad in some ways. But I have to tell you when I'm excited, and I am really excited about what God is going to do. And praise God, we're believing God that this week we are going to see great and mighty miracles happen because Jesus is alive and Jesus wants to heal you. He wants to set you free. And specifically, the Lord spoke to me that He wants to reveal Himself to you. Instead of you coming to get healed or coming to get prospered or coming to get your needs met, what you need is an encounter with the Lord. And when you really connect with Him, everything that He is and has is yours. And I promise you, you'll be healed, you'll be delivered, you'll get whatever you need. And sometimes we can get our eyes so much on what we need that we forget that it's Jesus that we need, more than the healing, more than anything else. And I believe that God is going to do some great things. I actually brought notes, which is nearly impossible for me to minister from. But the reason I did this is because God showed me specific things that He wants me to share with you. And I'm going to try and follow this and get through some things that God specifically spoke to me. But I'll confess to you up front, I'm not very good ministering from notes. But the Lord spoke to me that we need to really understand what His nature is, who God is. And there's a lot of people that have misunderstandings about God. And then I want to show who we are, and eventually I'm going to get to who we are in Christ, our new born-again self, but I am going to share who we are without Christ. And this is important. I don't think most people have a revelation of this. Matter of fact, Stephen Bransford, the man that does our media department, we were in Denver coming here, and both of us were getting our boots polished and we were talking to the man who was polishing our boots, and Stephen just asked him, he says, so, do you think people are basically good or basically bad? And he said, oh, they're basically good. Everybody's really good at their core, and if we just gave them the right environment and enough money and all of these things, then everybody would be good. And man, that is exactly opposite what the Bible teaches. And if you don't understand that, it's going to lead you to some wrong decisions some wrong things. So anyway, I'm going to be talking about who God is, who we are without Christ, and then who we are and what we have in Christ. And these things, many of the things that I'll be sharing may look like they're exact opposites of each other in the beginning. But it all ties together, and it really begins with you finding out who God is. 
If you don't understand the very nature and character of God, there is no way that you can really have a good relationship. And sad to say, this is where so many people are. They come to a meeting like this and you know that God exists, but you don't know Him. And I'm not talking about you aren't born again. You could be born again, but you don't have a relationship with Him. And therefore, it's easy for the devil to accuse you. And say, for instance, if you came for healing and if you don't instantly see something happen, you just fall for the lie that, well, God hasn't done anything. God didn't touch me. Because you don't know His nature and character and you're just going by what you feel and what you see and what somebody else has to say about Him. You need to know God, not just know about Him, but you need to know God. You cannot have a relationship with God if you don't first of all know His real nature and character. There is a lot of misinformation about God being put out. And a lot of it comes from the Bible. I'm going to be dealing with that tonight. A misinterpretation of the Bible. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman, that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There is a right way to interpret the word and a wrong way. And sad to say, a lot of religious teaching today is giving a wrong understanding of God because it takes the Old Testament wrath that was released and they present that this is the nature and the character of God. There is no scripture that says God is wrath. There is a verse that says, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, that God is love. And yet there is wrath from God revealed in the Old Testament. How do you rightly divide this? And this is what I want to talk about tonight and help you to see what the true nature of God is. It says in John chapter 8, verse 32, that you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. And so it's not good enough just to believe that there is a God and just to believe whatever you want to about Him. Let me say something right here that may shock some of you. But you know what idolatry is? A lot of people think, well, sure, idolatry is having some graven image and you pray to it or worship to it. Did you know idolatry is just making your own God? And there's many people that have not created an image and yet they have created their own God. I've actually heard people before say, well, I wouldn't worship a God that doesn't heal or that doesn't set free, or that doesn't do this. Did you know I understand what they're saying, but that's really wrong, because what you're saying is, I'm going to only worship God if He's like this. You are creating a God in your own image. You are, you are, that's idolatry. What we've got to do is go to the Word of God. God revealed Himself through His Word, and we have to accept the revelation that He's given us. Now, it's wonderful that we do serve a good God, a gracious God, a merciful God, a forgiving God. God is absolutely better than any of us could ever imagine. I agree with that, but did you know what? I am not going to go and say, God, I'll serve you if this is the way you are. He's God, and I'm not, and I just have to accept the revelation that He has given in His Word. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And that word there, given by inspiration of God, if you look it up in the Greek, it literally means that the Scripture is God-breathed. The Scripture is not man revealing their thoughts about God. There's a lot of people that believe this, and they think that this is an old book, that it was people writing their opinions of God, and so therefore they cherry-pick the parts that they like and what they want, and they just believe that it's fallible, it's, it's written by man. But the Scripture says about itself that it is God-breathed. God inspired the Word of God through people. It also says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, it says, "...whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises," talking about the Word of God, "...that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust." The way you partake of God is through the Scripture. God revealed Himself, and we have to take the revelation that God's Word gives. 
So I just want to introduce this, introduce this tonight by saying that you don't need to sit here and have these things and say, well, I believe this is the way that God is. I believe God ought to be like this. I wouldn't worship a God who does this. You need to just drop those things and say, what does the revealed Word of God teach about Him? And that's what I'm going to share with you tonight. And I tell you, if you don't really understand the true nature and character of God, you'll never understand your new nature. You'll never understand a lot of things. We are His offspring. It is not up to us to create a God in our own image that we want. We have to take the revealed revelation of God's Word. And so there's so many scriptures that talk about this. I haven't got time to go through all of it. But the Bible has been misinterpreted and misapplied. And even the devil tried to use scripture on Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, the devil said, If you be the Son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written, He shall give His angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. You know what he was doing? He was quoting Psalms chapter 91, verses 11 and 12. But here's what Psalms 91, 11 says. It says, For He shall give His angels charge over thee, and then it goes on to say, To keep thee in all thy ways. The devil just conveniently left that part of the scripture off, which means, see, he was just saying that God is going to protect you in anything you do, whether it's tempting him, whether it's going against his promises or not. That's not what the word of God says. So he left that part out and then he added some to it. It says, and in their hands, they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Satan said, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. So he took Bible truth, but he twisted it and applied it in a way that would have made it okay for Jesus to tempt God. And yet Jesus responded to him and said, get behind me, Satan. And he says, because it is written, and he quoted the scripture to him, that you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So my point is that if Satan tried to use scripture on Jesus then you know what? You could misinterpret the scripture. You need to take the word of God and you need to rightly divide the word. Here's what it says in Hebrews chapter one, verses one and two. God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the world's. This is saying that Jesus is a greater representation of God than anything that was ever said or done in the Old Testament. Not that the Old Testament was inaccurate, it was just incomplete. Jesus is the complete revelation of who God is. And in verse 3 it says, "...who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus is the perfect representation. And that word that was translated right there, that He is the um, express image. Did you know that the Greek word there is the word character? It's spelled exactly like our English word character. This is the, where we get the word character from, and it literally means an exact copy. Jesus is an exact copy of God. He is the perfect representation. Jesus said this of himself. He says, uh, Have I been so long time with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father, and how sayest thou? Then show us the Father. Jesus was such a perfect representation of God, He was able to tell His disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In John chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of Himself, but what He seeth the Father do. For what things soever He doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. I've actually had some people take that verse and say, well, this is showing that Jesus wasn't truly God because He said He couldn't do anything by Himself. It's actually just the opposite. This is Jesus claiming such a oneness with God the Father that they could not operate independent of each other. He couldn't do anything just of Himself. He and His Father were one is what He said. And if you have seen Him, then you have seen the Father and Jesus is the perfect representation. If you understand what He's saying right here, this answers a lot of questions about God. 
Some people think, well, is it God's will to heal everybody? Let me ask you, did Jesus ever put sickness on a person? Did Jesus ever say, no, you haven't learned your lesson yet. You aren't mature enough. You haven't suffered enough. I want you to suffer longer. There is not one single instance that Jesus ever refused to heal a person. There's a couple of times that people wouldn't receive the healing that he offered. It says in Mark chapter 6, verse 5, that he could do no mighty work, save that he laid his hand upon a few sick folk and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. It wasn't Jesus who wasn't able to minister the healing. It was them that wouldn't receive it. But there is not one single instance of Jesus not healing a person. There is not one single instance of Jesus laying hands on a person and giving them sickness. And yet there are people in the church today that says God is the one that gave you this trial. God is the one who wants you to be sick. They will say it's punishment for sin. Or sometimes they'll say that you're learning something by this. This is how God breaks you and makes you a better person. If that was true, well, then Jesus didn't accurately represent the Father because He never made a single person sick. He never refused to heal a person. He never sent anybody away unhealed. It says in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with power and with the Holy Ghost who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Jesus also set people free from demonic things. It's not God's will for a single person to be suffering under emotional things. If you are experiencing any of those things, if you're listening to what I'm saying, God is revealing Himself to you that Jesus came to set you free. It's the devil who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. John chapter 10, verse 10, but Jesus came to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. See, you need to take what the Word says right here and say, God, I know that my suffering, my problems, this is not you. This is not you. It's not God who's turned a deaf ear to you. There's multiple things at work, but somehow or another, it's the devil or your ignorance or your rebellion or there could be multiple things involved, but it's not God who is not healing you. It's not God who hasn't set you free. It's not God who's not given you an abundant life because He came to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. It says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, the last part of that verse, it says that God is love. That is who God is. That is His nature. That's the core of God. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus came to keep you from perishing. And this isn't talking about just going to hell. That's the extreme. That's the ultimate. But He came to give you life right now and to give you joy and peace. You don't have to wait until you die and go to heaven to start experiencing heaven. Jesus said to pray, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He wants you to have heaven here on earth. It's not just pie in the sky by and by, but it's steak on the plate while you wait. <laughs> Amen. God wants you to be blessed. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. This is how He's able to extend grace to you. And when I get into talking about who we are in Christ and who we are in just our natural self without Christ, I'll explain this a lot more in detail, and I think it'll really help you to understand it. But in Christ, we are now reconciled unto God. How did He reconcile us? By not imputing our trespasses unto us. This is another great revelation about God, is that He is not holding your sins against you. And brothers and sisters, the vast majority of the body of Christ does not understand this. The vast majority of the body of Christ believes that God is dealing with them according to their sins. And there's different degrees of this. Some people will believe that any sin in your life, God won't answer your prayers if you have any sin and they will just sit there and make you feel so depressed and so discouraged because your own heart will condemn you 
and recognize that you're falling short. And I have met hundreds, probably thousands of people who knew that God exists. They had had a touch from God, but they just couldn't live perfectly. And they thought they had to be perfect before God would answer their prayers. And they just finally despaired of it and went the other direction, not because they didn't believe that God exists. They just thought, there's no way I can meet this standard. But then there's other people that believe, well, you won't go to hell. You won't necessarily be hated by God, but He won't answer your prayers. He won't bless you. He won't use you. But this verse says that He does not impute our trespasses unto us. All of our sins have been atoned for, past, present, and even future sins. Sins you hadn't even committed yet have been put upon the Lord Jesus and He forgave you of sins that you haven't even committed yet. And I know somebody's thinking, how can God forgive a sin before I commit it? You better pray that He can <laughs> because He only died for your sins one time 2,000 years ago and if He can't forgive sins before you commit them, then you can't be forgiven. He can forgive sins. Your sins have been forgiven. Now, does that mean that you're free to go live in sin. I'll be dealing with this in more detail too. But no, even though God is not bringing His judgment on sin, Satan gains inroad to you through your sin. So if you go out and are living in sin, Satan is going to eat your lunch and... There you go. So you do not want to live in sin. It's just stupid. Quit living in sin. But what I'm saying is God loves you, stupid. Amen. He's not holding your sins against you, but Satan will make you pay if you're living in sin. So quit doing it. I was using so much cocaine that I was really completely out of myself. I had a few times I put a gun against my head and I just wanted to blow my brains out. I said, God, if you really, really exist, if you are really, really God, you need to help me because I'm going to die. As the number one ecstasy dealer in Portugal, Johan had it all. Money, power, a family, everything that the world says will make you happy. And yet, he hated himself. To numb this self-rejection, Johan buried himself in cocaine and one day found himself in a Portugal prison where at the lowest point in his life, God reached out to him. One night I was sitting on, the, uh, on my bed and suddenly out of nothing, an image came where I heard my mom and the pain on the face of my mom shocked me. And now I saw it and I felt it. And then another image came into my mind and another image came into my mind. And of all the people that I heard, it was like a, a thousand kilos was pushing me down. I couldn't get up from the floor. And then suddenly my cell was filled with a light that was so bright, it looked like the sun was shining in my cell. I was screaming, forgive me. God, forgive me, please forgive me. Forgive me, Father, forgive me. I don't, I, I don't know why I become that person. I don't want that person anymore. I don't want to be that person anymore. Please forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. But he just hushed me. He just hushed me. He says, you're already forgiven. And I just had an ocean of love overflowing me. I mean, a tsunami of love and grace overflowing me. And I was washed from the inside out and from the outside in. After serving 10 years in prison, Johan was released back to his wife, Brenda, in Holland. And while searching to know more about the God he met in captivity, the Holy Spirit led him to Bible teacher, Andrew Womack. Suddenly, I was thrown back into the same freedom that I had when I was receiving Jesus in my prison cell. Then the Bible became more alive and I started praying in a different way and I see all these things changing in my life. From there, Johan and Brenda enrolled into Andrew's school, Karis Netherlands, where they saw God's word restore their marriage and heal all the wounds from their past. It was at this time that God called them to start the One in Him Foundation, a ministry where they are now sharing the love of Jesus all around the world. To see Johan's full grace encounter, visit awmi.net.
it's better to give Jesus a hand. Amen. Because he's done all the work. Amen. And of Hallelujah. course, there's so much more that we could share than yeah. what that little video showed. But tell them about uh, your healing that you had. That yes. is absolutely Amen. miraculous. Well, uh, we've been uh, through a lot of uh, mission trips to Brazil. And um, uh, basically, there was an outbreak of uh, yellow fever. And it's a deadly virus. And uh, I never am stung by any mosquitoes, but uh, that time I was stung by a mosquito and uh, I had the yellow fever. I didn't know it, but when I went back to Holland, uh, the doctors told me, ah, we got some bad news for you. Uh, you have yellow fever, your organs are going to bleed, you're going to be turning into yellow, and, you're gonna, and you can probably die. I said, well, first of all, let me stop you there. Yellow is not my color. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> some people are yellow, but it's not my color. My organs are not going to bleed, and I am not going to die because I'm going to live. That's what my father says. I break it in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So, uh, when, I, when they told me the next day, I was healed. So, uh, you know, that's cool. But um, that's basically the father that we are serving, you know. And now I know my daddy, God is my father, and all the other things that I desire in my life, he is giving it to us. We live in prosperity. We live in supernatural health. He restored our family, our children, our marriage. And I've got so many testimonies. I can speak on till tomorrow morning. And I won't be, you know, it's, it will never end. We got a good God. Hallelujah. All right, Brenda, let's hear from you. How is your Oh, life my. Well, we, we've been together for 24 years. And only the last year since we've been through Caris Bible College, Amen. only then started our marriage. And now we're walking with Jesus. I, I would encourage everybody who's in here, just go to a school nearby because it's going to change your life.